Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the IMA CMHS Virtual Healthcare Research Seminar Series for this year. Uh, today we have with us Professor Sriram Shankar Narayanan. Uh, he is a faculty in the production and quantity methods area at IM Ahmedabad. Uh, he recently joined us, but before he came to IMA, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Canada Excellence Research Chair in Data Science for Real-Time Decision-Making at Polytechnic Montreal. Uh, he has been doing quite a bit of work on optimization, in particular real-time decision-making. Uh, today, he will speak to us on his research paper titled Fairness Over Time in Dynamic Resource Allocation, which has an application in healthcare. And uh, without much delay, let us all join our hands to welcome Shriram for this wonderful talk. We are awaiting for it, Shriram. So the floor is yours. Uh, you can uh, get started. And if there are questions, I'll help you to moderate with that. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Devjit. Uh, and yes, I can start my presentation without much delay. Uh, so the talk is about uh, a concept called enhancing fairness over time with uh, applications specific to uh, for resource allocation problems and we have a application about how to allocate ambulance vehicles in a city. This is a joint work with Andrea Lodi, Jill Pesson and Philippe Olivier, all of them uh, who are in uh, Polytechnic Montreal now. So. Uh, through this presentation, we are going to look at uh, this problem in four uh, parts. First, I'll decide, uh, I'll define the problem for you. Then I'll go through the case, which is really easy. By easy, I mean uh, not necessarily easy to uh, derive the solutions, but you know you have closed form solutions, etc. And you know you could basically calculate the solution with a calculator or an Excel sheet. And then we will go to the next level where it is really hard and an ob obvious algorithm how and why can it fail and then i'll present the algorithm that we actually use to solve this problem so to begin with let me ask with a question that uh, my mom uh, had probably when i was a child so i like this dish called avial it's a it's a dish from heaven and it is absolutely delicious my sister and my father they liked another dish called Toran. These are South Indian dishes, which you much more than dosa and idli, but you should try. So, my mother likes both. Now, the question is what should my mother choose to cook? Should she make avial, which I like, or toran, which both my sister and my father like? Well, there is one rule my mom is not ready to cook two dishes, one for me and one for them. That's out of question. All right. So, what could my mother do? She could be an efficient person, she says, I'll cook toran because that gives maximum utility and maximum satisfaction to maximum number of people. Two people like toran. So that's what I'm going to cook. Well, this is one way of solving the problem. But what would a fair mother do? She might probably think of the problem in terms of multiple durations. She's not going to cook just for one day. But think about two days and then say, OK, I'll cook toran one day and avial another day. The concept that I'm trying to motivate here is when decision making could be done on a repeated manner, when we are going to take a similar type of decision repeatedly, then it is possible to make decisions in such a way that it enhances fairness. Well, in this, when, when she said, okay, we are going to look at two days and it's going to be Toren on the first day and avial on the second day, she indeed changed the game, changed the problem of deciding over two days, but still we obtained some uh, a decision which is significantly better than what we had before. You know, there could be some natural complications. That was a gross simplification to show the idea. One could say, well, I like another dish, mango parchedi. Maybe not as much as avial. The preference need not be binary, or I could have a dish which you know, I don't like much, but it's not, I don't hate it either. Or something could be completely, you know, I cannot have upma, something like that. So that could be one complication where these preferences are not binary. And another complication is, what if she's cooking not just for the three of us, but let's say somebody wants to cook for 50 people and 50 people have different sets of preferences. 
and sometimes small modifications could be possible or you know maybe if two dishes are very similar maybe dosa and uthappam then you could probably make them on the same day without much difficulty whereas something very different <coughs> could be hard to make right away and you know there could be other complications coming from you know whether vegetables and the ingredients for the food could be available at a certain time I, all that i'm trying to say here is this problem could lead to natural complications we will see these complications in the form of an ambulance allocation problem soon but be before going into the real application i just want to motivate these ideas okay next question next this is another statement which should probably be in your mind through this talk when we say allocation we don't necessarily mean allocation what do i mean by that statement is tomato a fruit or a vegetable probably if there are botanists in this uh, in this uh, audience you might say tomato is a fruit but you know pretty much nobody is going to uh, say that i am eating a fruit if you are munching tomatoes or you are not going to call tomato juice fruit juice or you don't find it in a fruit salad so what happened is there tomatoes vegetable traditionally but botanists for their scientific analysis came up with a specific definition for a fruit and then you know by that definition this the definition of fruit was a little more general and tomato got included in that definition so when we talk about allocation we are going to speak of allocation in the same way it's not just about giving one dish to person a and something else to person b so what do we mean by allocation so throughout this talk an allocation is going to be a decision made by a single decision maker and this decision could be anything it could be for example the route that a bus has to go through to serve uh, people along across the city it could be uh, something like the order in which a certain jobs are scheduled in a server so all these decisions we call them allocation if there are multiple agents who could have potentially different utilities uh, due to these allocations which is if the bus goes through a single route one then person a prefers it and if the bus goes through Uh, route two, then person B prefers it. As I said, this decision could be anything. For example, it is a courier company sending couriers to uh, a bunch of people. Uh, uh, there are always going to be agents who want to receive the courier first, and they might be the happiest people if they receive the courier first. But I want to also highlight the fact that here we are going to talk about decisions, which means we are very clearly going to stay away from games. in a game you have multiple agents with their own respective utilities but each of those agents could take a decision by themselves whereas in this case all these agents only uh, enjoy or suffer the consequence of the decision but there is a single unique decision maker who is going to uh, make the decision and that decision is going to consider the utilities of all these agents so that's this is exactly what we mean by an allocation problem it's called allocation only because the original roots of the problem come from actually di dividing some uh, set of objects and allocating it to multiple people but in general it could just be a decision making problem okay. uh, so naturally this seems to be connected to an optimization problem uh, many of us would have seen an optimization problem in general so you have something called an objective function and you minimize or maximize that objective function uh with the assumption that this x this decision comes from a certain set called the feasible set uh, i see somebody has a question or somebody has a raised hand uh, i can take that question hey dr shaikh you can unmute and speak Let's find. We can go ahead. Okay. If there is question, I will just sure. uh, prompt it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and typically, in, just for the sake of the talk, let's assume that the uh, whenever we speak about optimization, the uh, objective function is linear, and that is without loss of generality. There are some standard techniques and tricks that you could use to get this. And in this allocation problem, uh, the traditionally studied allocation problem, what you have, you have 
a benefit functions for n agents. That's what we refer here by tau one to tau n. Each person has a benefit and a decision is made from this feasible set, uh, script X, just like before. And instead of maximizing or minimizing a single uh, person's benefit or some measure of efficiency, you consider a function of the benefits obtained by each of the N agents. So this fee, we could call it as, uh, it could be a measure of unfairness. For example, if all tau one, tau two, up to tau n of x are all equal, you could say phi takes the smallest value. And this is typically the approach we are going to take when we are going to study fairness. A function which takes in the benefit of all the n participants and spits out how fair or unfair is this decision. And you know we could also restrict ourselves to linear benefits for each person, but typically this phi is going to be not a nonlinear function. It could be piecewise linear and you know a polyhedral function, a function which could be re represented with some uh, linear inequalities and uh, integer variables. But in, in, in general, phi is not linear. And we are, it could, one could also see that this optimization problem is just a special case of this allocation problem because one could always say you are interested in an efficient allocation where you know you are just max, uh, maximizing the benefit of all the n agents. This could be unfair per se. All right. Next, uh, just like the mother who decided to uh, cook for two days, cook uh, Toren and Aviel for two days, we could consider a multiple period allocation problem where, uh, and for this talk, we are going to assume that this benefit obtained by multiple agents, they are additive. So basically, if you are deciding over T periods, if you are going to work on T rounds of decision making, you could basically average the uh, benefits each player obtained over T, play, uh, T periods and then pass it through the same uh, fairness metric or unfairness metric. So this is going, uh, going to be the setting that we, are, that we will be working on. Now comes a question, what is fair in the sense how do we choose this function phi? Well, there are various definitions of fairness. You could uh, listen to various political campaigns depending upon each person's political beliefs. You could define fairness as nobody left behind. Somebody might say, you know, if in the world of, uh, I don't know, 7 billion people, if you look at the standard of living of the poorest person, if that person is reasonably well off, then you can say that the world is reasonably fair or, you know, somebody might consider whatever is the difference between the richest person that you consider the difference in the quality of living between Jeff Bezos' life and the poorest person. And, you know, consider something like that as a measure of fairness. Uh, as uh, computational people, as experts in optimization, we do not want to get into the debate of what is fair and how to define fairness. So. As long as, you know, there are some broad axioms, uh, there are technical axioms, which I don't want to get in now. If a social scientist or a uh, humanities person comes up with any reasonable uh, function of fairness, we would like to create a tool that can solve this problem. We do not want a tool that will work only with a certain measure of fairness. And that is again going to be uh, what is uh, coming in the rest of the talk we will be agnostic to the choice of fee. Any reasonable choice of fee should be working. For, uh, our tool should be able to handle that. And there is a caveat here. When we talk about fairness, we do not want very inefficient solutions. I said that I don't like a certain dish and my sister and father doesn't like a certain dish. But, you know, mother could say, okay, everybody have bitter good. None of you like it. You all experience the same amount of unhappiness. So it is an absolutely fair way for me to cook food for all of you. We don't want such solutions. We don't want inefficient solutions. Uh, what I said might look like a joke, but when you are computationally solving a problem, it, uh, these effects creep in very easily and it needs sufficient care to ensure such trivial solutions do not uh, pollute our solution pool. Okay. Now let's ask uh, preliminary questions. So what are we after? We observe that there is a three-way trade-off between unfairness, 
inefficiency and large t and by capital t i mean the number of rounds of decision making uh re some uh, existing literature has primarily been targeting the trade off between unfairness and inefficiency and we add this new angle of large t also but i'll give you a flavor of what could happen so suppose you don't care about being unfair uh, about being unfair all that you want is uh, efficiency and uh, good solution then you could just solve a regular optimization problem which maximizes efficiency whatever uh, maximizes the sum of utility etc and it completely uh, it could be completely an unfair solution but is guaranteed to be very very efficient or you know you could have this uh, funny solution which i just told you give everybody zero benefit nobody is happy which is completely fair to everybody because you are no worse off than anybody else but it is grossly inefficient because you could probably have made at least somebody happy or you know sometimes you could say repeated decision making over time the fairness gets added up but let's say you are uh, in a real life problem the number of rounds of decision making required is uh, you know hundreds of years then probably nobody cares if if you say yeah we are fair to this person in a uh, time period of 200 years so we want so we we want to be we want to have a small t we want to be reasonably efficient and we also want to be reasonably fair and the question is which trade offs are we ready to make and in some cases it is very easy to say uh, what trade off is with what trade offs are available and what is easy so we th these are going to be a first set of closed form results which means uh the, the formulas might look bad but basically you could enter these numbers in a calculator and you could get a solution so we are going to consider n agents each of them is going to have a linear benefit uh and the first allocation the set of possible allocations is you have a articles and these a articles have to be allocated to n people and each person's uh benefit by obtaining xi number of articles is just proportional to that tau i x i so we give two results here so one so so first we want to be absolutely fair let's say we want to be perfectly fair then we are saying whenever this t bar which is the number of rounds of decision making is lesser than a certain closed form uh, expression then perfect fairness can never ever be achieved for in any eta less than one eta is going to be the measure of inefficiency so eta equal to 1 is basically giving zero to everybody and eta equal to zero corresponds to no inefficiency at all you make a, you solve the optimization problem maximizing efficiency and allocate so you know there is always this trivial solution of not allocating anything to anybody so except for that trivial solution no perfectly fair solution is possible if you are uh, if the number of rounds is lesser than a t bar which can be calculated in a closed form and as long as t bar is t, the number of rounds is more than this t bar which is given by this expression if your eta which means your tolerance for inefficiency is greater than this metric then perfect fairness can always be achieved and this metric you can see this this is we are not giving a trivial bound which is equal to 1 or sometimes could be greater than 1 you can see this is always less than 1 because uh tau 1 by tau 1 already becomes 1 and then you are subtracting some positive quantity from 1 and as long as you know you you are ready to allow this amount of inefficiency perfect fairness can always be achieved this is one set of closed form results and another set of closed form results is again similar you have let's say a amount of money so here the number of the, the amount of money you divide for n people need not be an integer you could give somebody i don't know 4 and a half million dollars or something like that but in a single round you don't want to give money to more than r people you want to limit the number of people whom you give money it's like a sparsity constraint again something that is uh, of interest to a lot of people you you know you could trivially see at t bar equal to n by r fair solutions can be achieved the, you could make a trivial solution but the interesting thing is for any t bar strictly less than this limit fair, perfect fairness can again never be achieved 
uh, I, I'm again barring for that trivial solution, which is you give nothing to nobody. Barring for that trivial solution, perfect fairness can never be achieved in fewer rounds. And in these many rounds as more, again, we have a similar result. As long as your eta is your tolerance for inefficiency is uh, reasonably good, perfect fairness can always be achieved. And just in case somebody wants to see this known closed form expression, these are <laughs> the closed form expressions. I don't know if that is of any interest, but uh, you know, it's, it's a closed form expression at the end of the day, you could calculate this in a, in a calculator. You, you don't need to solve a huge program or anything. Great. Uh, and another uh, important point to note is both these results hold for any valid choice of unfairness function. These are not really dependent upon the uh, choice of fee, the unfairness function that you use, the measure of unfairness that you use. These results hold agnostic to the choice of p. So we looked at two special types of set. Uh, so this one is a simplex, and this one is uh, kind of a simplex with uh, sparsity constraints. So when we talk about sets, people in optimization always like to talk about convex sets, because they are, in some sense, easy and nice enough sets to ha handle. And what we can prove for convex sets is, this, this third trade-off, which we talked about, large T, that is pretty much useless in the sense, if your script X is a convex set, then either you get perfect fairness in just one round or perfect fairness is never achieved, which means repeating this, this problem is interesting only if the set of allocations possible is a, uh, is a non-convex set. It, 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 it is actually a simple enough proof but still uh, surprising and nice enough to know. Now let's consider general X. So, so these were very specific cases where we gave closed form results. And for convex, we said there is no hope. But now let's consider a general X. This X could be anything. It could be the set of all uh, traveling salesman tours in a graph, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. So now for the general X, what we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we could write an integer programming formulation as shown here. So it is trivial. You want each uh, time t, the decision to fall in your set, and then you are computing the average benefits obtained by a player, and then you are minimizing the fairness function. So how do we solve this problem? This problem seems to be uh, straightforward enough, but computationally, it's not very easy to solve the problem. So one you could do is greedy method, uh, greedy algorithms which means in time one, you can maybe go for an efficient solution. And then in each time, you try to find what is the <coughs> uh, so what is the allocation you can choose that enhances fairness the most. And you keep repeating this for T rounds. But typically, our experience was we got solutions that are poor in efficiency as well as poor in fairness. In the sense, uh, and, and also, once you get a solution, there is no understanding or hope of how to improve the solution in either of these two directions. And also there is a problem of uh, pro pro uh, symmetry. So if you have some x1 to xt as a solution, then every permutation is also a solution. And typically in this case, cutting, branching are all inefficient. So we are going to take a completely different route. Uh, and people who are here for the fairness application, please pardon me. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, slightly mathematical stuff before coming to the application. And once we come to the application, I promise these are all going to tie together well. Good. So an alternate formulation is, uh, let's say we, are, we have different allocations for time one to t, but we are not, in each period, we are not going to decide what the allocation is instead we are going to count how many times each allocation will occur in the entire T period horizon. So we are going to consider allocation one, allocation two, uh, allocation K, and then say how many times is allocation one used ever in the solution of T time periods? How many times is the allocation two? So if you have come across cutting stock problem, et cetera, this might, have, this might be familiar to you. You know, you count the number of patterns rather than decide the patterns also. But this is tricky because your set 
set of all possible decisions script x could be a uh, could be a uh, infinite set and you might have infinitely many variables but again we have column generation or branch and price to the rescue you could start with a small number of uh, allocations and then you know on demand add uh, add the columns as required well uh, this is the overview now let's jump into an application the healthcare application which is uh, in an ambulance allocation problem so the problem is as follows you have multiple uh, residential areas across the city it's, they need not be even connected and you have very few ambulances compared to how many residential areas you have and various benefit metrics are possible in the sense let's say uh, in the geography geography of uh, i am ahmedabad so let's say you have an ambulance waiting for all of us here in inside the iim campus then we are going to be very happy and let's say we give a benefit of one or we could say there is an, the nearest ambulance is actually in near vastrapur market then we might not be as happy and give a benefit one but you know we might give a slight a fraction of benefit so you know that that's what we define by these uh, connectivities it is in a neighborhood but not right in the place or it could be completely far away for example you can consider this node and this node in that case you get no benefit at all whatsoever or you know there, there could be a different type of benefit it might be for uh, old people you uh, there is value if uh, an ambulance can reach your place within 15 minutes if it is over 15 minutes doesn't matter whether it is half an hour or one hour it is not much value you could have such a benefit function again we like to stay agnostic about the benefit functions too uh, the only uh, only thing we impose is that it be polyhedral which means the benefit function can be defined using a set of linear functions and integer variables uh, something like a piecewise linear function is good enough let's say and again fairness metric on uh, agnostic and we could also have different types of efficiency me measures the efficiency measure could be something like okay we have uh, 10 regions in the city at least seven regions should be happy at all times that could be uh, the efficiency metric or the efficiency metric could be something like the total benefit across all the regions should be greater than a certain threshold so many efficiency metrics are also uh, possible and the computational experience we had uh, with this is that the greedy algorithms were terrible <coughs> and solving the problem in a native form which was the easy formulation which i showed you that was again very very slow especially as the number of rounds of decision making increased but the alternate formulation using column generation the branch and price approach that was considerably faster in the sense when where the direct formulation did not solve the problem or even find good feasible solutions in one hour or one and a half hours the branch and price solved this problem within a matter of one minute or one and a half minutes but there is going to be a constraint now consider the same graph that we were looking at before uh, let's so the decision is we want to decide where uh, we put the ambulances right so if, in, let's say three different configurations so you can see configuration a b and c here and we put con uh, ambulances wherever you see this uh, plus sign on this uh, slide so due to uh, oh i think somebody raised their hand uh, we can take the question no i think it is a by mistake problem okay okay, uh, okay. so we can see uh, three different uh, configurations and due to logic so i said uh, i when i motivated with the example of food my mother could change the dish that she prepared today versus what she prepared tomorrow but it is not always possible that the ambulance configuration today can completely change tomorrow maybe some changes are possible but the logistic uh, logistical issues associated with you know uh, relocating the ambulance bases the labor issues etc etc are typically hard typically too much that you don't want too many changes in the ambulance allocation so you know for example in this graph you had these two uh, connected components maybe you allow one uh, shift of one ambulance from this connected region so for example here to here you, you see the, the mouse pointer right devji yes okay so maybe from this configuration to this configuration is okay 
this one to this one is okay, but you don't want to jump from here to here because that is changing too many ambulances from uh, this connected component to the other one. Uh, and this transition, it on from a uh, very naive perspective, this looks like a small uh, problem, but we will see this is actually going to be a huge, huge headache. So why is this a problem? So for one reason, our branch and price, column generation completely stops working. Uh, why, why does it stop working? So in column generation, I said you only count number of times each configuration is used, right? So I'll just give you an example with six allocations, which is like a completely toy example. So you have six allocations, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then branch and price says use allocation A twice, allocation B thrice, allocation C once, and eat right. Well, so you, you use this many number of times. And I also have given you what allocation can you move from what allocation to. So you could move from A to B, C, D. And for keeping things simple, I have even kept it uh, symmetric. So if you move from A to B, you can always move from B to A. But this is the type of solution your column generation will give. Can you even tell me if this is feasible looking at this solution? So once you solve the problem in branch and price format, as soon as you have this transition constraints, even checking feasibility seems like a hard problem. And well, uh, let's, let's see how we can check feasibility because when we optimize something, the first thing we would like to do is at least ensure we have something feasible. So for feasibility, we define something called as a configuration graph. What do we mean by configuration graph? So we have set of vertices for each types of allocation. So this is these two vertices for A and two vertices because allocation A appears twice and three vertices for B because allocation B appears thrice and so on for all vertices. Now we add edges. So from A, you can go to B, C and D. So you add edges to every B, C and D vertex. Similarly do from B to A, E and F. So complete this uh, edge addition. And what we get, we call this the configuration graph. And what we show, show is uh, if you can answer whether this graph has a Hamiltonian path. By Hamilton, a Hamiltonian path is a, a sequence of steps. You start from some vertex of your choice. You walk along the edges and you visit every, every vertex in the graph exactly once. You need not return to the same point. You need not minimize cost, nothing like that. You start from one vertex and you go around the graph minim uh, visiting every vertex exactly once. So the question, does this graph have such a path? Is this possible in the uh, graph? That's the question, does this graph have a Hamiltonian path? And this is a known NP hat problem. So which means once you solve this problem in a branch and price format, even deciding the feasibility of that solution is an NP hat problem. But well, okay, as integer programmers, most of us don't really care about NP hardness. We go and uh, use our tools against that anyway, but let's go ahead. So a possible algorithm, the, the most obvious one that comes to your mind is solve the version without these transition constraint using branch and price. Check if this uh, uh, characteristic graph has the uh, Hamiltonian path in it. And if there is a Hamiltonian path, you are done. You are happy. You can return the solution. If not, you add a cut that uh, separates the solution. This is, this is the most immediate thing that comes to mind, but this is not going to work. Why is this not, not going to work? Here is an example. This is an example with just three locations, A, B, and C. And you can imagine this as B being in the center and A and C on either side. You can go from A to B. You can go from B to C but A to C is not allowed or C to A is not allowed. So let's try solving this problem for uh, time horizon of two. So <clears throat> what we could see is two zero zero. Let, let, let's, let's say two zero zero is, uh, is a solution obtained from branch and price. That is feasible because all transition constraints are satisfied. You are not even transitioning. You are staying in A, so that is fine. Zero zero two is also fine because you are staying in C uh, this is A, number of times you are in A, number of times you are in B, and number of times you are in C. So both these points turn out to be feasible, but let's say you have to be in A once and C once and never in B. This is not infeasible because as we originally said, A to C jumps or C to A jumps are not allowed. 
So what did we observe? Two points are feasible, but another point in the convex hull is not feasible. Which, and if this is the case, then how, how do we hope to separate this point? So one, no cut exists which separates this point. If you add a cut, it either cuts away uh, one or both of these uh, feasible solutions also. You cannot add a cut which only separates this infeasible solution. This infeasible solution could strictly be in the convex hull. And typically regular branching techniques do not work because of problems with regular bra uh, branching rules that IP solvers have. One uh, idea that could get around this is to look at the problem in an extended formulation, which means uh, you look at the problem in a higher dimension, you add a bunch of variables, and then see if you could add a cut in the higher dimension. For example, you could see the point E is in the convex hull here, and you cannot add a cut to separate point E. But if you consider, if you uh, lift it to a higher dimension, then E could be made like a vertex, and you could cut E off. The same thing can be done in this problem by completely binarizing every variable, but that we found it is extremely slow computationally because typically the number of uh, new variables to add to the problem is extremely large compared to the problem size. So, so that simple and obvious approach that one would think of would not work. Well, then we could go for a Another approach, which is which is an approach which uses tools from constraint programming. So we looked at the CC, we looked at the CG configuration graph earlier, but now we are going to consider slightly different uh, object, which is a graph where we, you know, uh, do not actually repeat each of these vertex the number of times, uh, number of times they appeared in the branch and trace solution. We just have one vertex for each configuration, and then we uh, fill the edges just like before. Now, I'm seeing something. So any walk in this graph of length t is a feasible solution to our original problem. You could draw this graph, and then a walk is just a sequence of uh, vertices uh, that are connected to each other. So if you consider any walk of length t, that is the feasible solution to the original problem. It, you might ask, you said that it's an NP hard problem. How is it so easy? But see, there is a uh, subtle difference between that and here. In that, you gave me a very specific solution and asked me if that solution is feasible. That is very hard for me to do. But here I'm just doing something else. I'm saying, okay, given this problem, I'm giving you some feasible solution of my choice. And that is much faster. And, and, and the, uh, it is an easy, easy enough lemma to prove that any walk of length t in this graph is actually a feasible solution to the original problem. Well, what do constraint programming solvers do? So they can solve over a set of all uh, graphical structures. That's the power of constraint programming solvers. So for example, you, it could solve a problem like among all walks of length l in this graph, can you find a walk that minimizes a polyhedral function? So constraint programming solvers can solve a problem of this form. But the difference from IPS, constraint programming solvers solve this for very small graphs, maybe graphs with 30 or up to 50 uh, vertices or something. Uh, whereas IP solve general integer programming with even thousands of variables, hopefully. And so this means we could immediately uh, have a subset of configurations, subsets of ambulance configurations, and then say within this configuration, uh, find a walk of length t that minimizes your unfairness metric. And that is exactly what we do. But there is a question about which subset to choose. But before going there, let's contrast this against the greedy algorithm. So what are we doing in the greedy algorithm? In the greedy algorithm, we are always looking one step ahead. And when we are looking at one step ahead, we are choosing absolutely the best decision. Maybe in that one step, uh, we are considering the allocation, which minimizes the unfairness as much as possible. We don't care about what happens in the next two to t uh, uh, steps. But here we are doing exactly the opposite. We are only considering a handful of uh, configurations which could actually not be the best among the whole lot. We are considering a small handful of configurations 
but we are ordering these handful of configurations such that these are best for the entire t period uh, planning horizon so we let go of this myopic uh, tendency that the greedy algorithm has and in exchange for that we are uh, compromising a bit on how good are our decisions in this short term and we will see that this uh, generally helps and now comes the question but how do you choose the small subset of decisions which are not the best maybe but reasonably good enough well that is easy you could you could always consider uh, the solution given by column generation with a caveat so let's go through this algorithm uh, in slightly uh, in in a broad one in a broad manner so you start with the problem uh, ambulance allocation problem you forget the integer constraint and transition constraint everything you solve that using column generation yeah and you get you immediately get a upper bound uh, you, you 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 immediately get a lower bound now this column generation without integer variable so it is fast is going to have non zero uh, solution values only for a handful of configurations now collect these handful of configuration and make it as ccg and give this to the constraint programming solver the constraint programming solver is now going to only consider all solutions which appeared in this handful of configurations and it is going to give you a very good feasible solution which uses only this handful and now you could add a cut to this original problem uh, as shown in uh, point 6 that you know all t of the decisions cannot come only from this handful of solutions but remember this cut is not like a valid inequality this is actually invalid because it is going to cut away a bunch of solutions but our uh, guarantee is that any solution cut that is cut away by this inequality is being handled by the constraint programming solver already so we don't actually care if some of the feasible solutions are cut away and but this inequality is added to the original problem and we iterate and what we observe is computationally this performs much much better than uh, the greedy algorithm or, or uh, the solving the problem in the native form and we uh, uh, digit should i stop giving some time for questions maybe uh, you are muted again. Uh, maybe in another 2 minutes or so sure so the the computational testing was done using certain parameters which were given by somebody who actually gave us data to solve this problem uh, we had this this problem was requested by uh, the city management in a city called utrecht in a, in a region called utrecht in amsterdam and or am i wrong devjit it's a city of utrecht city of utrecht is a part of the netherlands it is okay. it is about yeah. it is one of the biggest uh, town way old town here yeah. okay so sorry about it it's not amsterdam it's the city of utrecht netherlands and uh, and they wanted to and and they had very limited number of ambulances uh, for the population and requirements of the city and the uh, political situation there the parties there they had a very specific uh, way of deciding uh, what uh, what efficiency metrics should they have and what fairness metrics should they have they actually liked the difference between the maximum and minimum uh, covered people as as small as possible so we had that real life instance and we also generated about 200 synthetic in, uh, instances the the uh, most interesting insight we had here is that the problem was not getting too hard if the number of nodes or number of ambulances all the increase it was actually uh, agnostic to the number of uh, the, to the size of the problem what seemed to be more decisive is this transition constraint how imposing is this transition constraint uh, and you know typically for none none of these 200 problems were solved by a greedy algorithm or by a complete Uh, you know the naive formulation which i was talking about but with the branch and price and uh, the uh, constraint programming based approach a lot of these problems were solved to optimality and you can see as the, the so transition you allow so as you allow lesser and lesser transition you could see that the problem became more and more uh, difficult to solve and uh, 
but but you know it was good enough uh, for us to solve the problem uh, problem about utrecht problem given by utrecht and uh, yeah we, uh, that's that's where we are but you know we could have some potential improvements also thank you uh, maybe not with a handshake thank you thank you shriram uh, we'll open up the floor for questions uh, if you want to uh, directly ask, either you can ask in the chat or you can unmute and speak. If you can raise your hand, I can allow you to talk as well. Okay, Sachin. Please go ahead, Sachin. Okay, so I, I was not able to see the unmute options. So now I think you have enabled this for me. Now, uh, uh, Sriram, uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I missed the first few minutes. And then in between, when you move from uh, the description of the difficulty in handling the transition constraint to the point where you handle this using constraint programming, mm -hmm. I think I lost my connection. So the screen had frozen. So I missed that part. But if I understand correctly, uh, the reason why you're saying is transition constraint is difficult to handle is, is this because the transition constraint involves a relationship between the elements of different columns in your column generation. That's yes, why. Yes. Okay, so that's that's exactly that's right. I mean, you, it's not possible for you to formulate it as a column generation problem once you uh, take that constraint into account. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. In fact, well, in fact, what we showed us, if you so for one second, you solve the problem with column generation, forgetting that constraint. Now checking if the solution that you had even satisfied that constraint is actually an NP hard problem. And this is what you are trying to solve, trying to verify using constraint constraint programming, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. I would like to get some more details probably offline. Uh, sure, sure, absolutely, yes. Good, any other questions? Oh, if then I have a question, uh, Shriram. So usually, you know, such problems uh, are always there, not just ambulances, but also, for example, fire stations, how many fire trucks, these are, these are a common uh, problem, right? right? So is it more of a general class of problems you're trying to solve or only like a uh, application for health? Uh, no, no, it, it, it is a general class of problems for sure. As I motivated the uh, allocation problem could even be uh, something like, uh, a set of TSP routes and everything. And also, because, can you incorporate uh, additional now? Maybe because it's already developed, you can think. I'm not sure whether if some routes are more congested than the others, right? Yes. And still, you have a kind of SLA for uh, you know reaching its time in maybe whatever bounds you have. Mm -hmm. So and yes, and also you know some routes may be more congested within certain hours. Uh, some may be less. So can all of those be incrementally be accounted or it is like very hard to account for? So, so those types of constraints are uh, easy to account. What, what would be slightly harder to account is if you want to uh, go through a certain route today and then the route that you go through tomorrow should only be slightly different from the route that you go through today. That will again, that, that's exactly the way these transition constraints are going to uh, manifest itself. Right, because I look this is more of a class of matching problems, right? For example, also in ride sharing, uh, you have yeah. a very similar kind of a uh, problem because uh, you know multiple people are dying in different locations. Yes. Uh, one may want to go farther, and uh, one may want to go close by. Yes. So there's the issue of fairness, how do you allocate them? Ideally, yes. if you allocate to the farther one, you get more money, but then the other one might be closer by, maybe short distance. So yeah. these, are, these are similar, uh, of course, the emergencies might be very different, but I think you have a similar kind of challenge in other cases also. Yes, but yes. so in ride sharing, et cetera, it's slightly less relevant because it is almost always a private party which is doing that and they try to uh, you know, keep uh, efficiency to the maximum. Uh, so an another application which we were thinking of is uh, you know, in in developing countries, how do you allocate uh, doctors to various small villages, etc.? So you know, you don't have enough doctors to permanently be present in every corner of the city, of, of the country. So now you have a cohort of doctors, and you want those doctors to 
move around in small regions. Uh, let's say you could have a doctor who will be in city A on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then the doctor moves to uh, nearby city B on Wednesdays and Thursdays, something like that. So, and you know, you don't want the doctor to travel too much and waste time in traveling as opposed to being a doctor. But at the same time, you don't want the doctor to be located in one single location. So problems like these uh, also necessarily have the form that we discussed today. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Devjit, I just have one more point. Please, please go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, Sriram, your uh, uh, description of this uh, uh, doctor's problem actually reminded me of something that uh, a student uh, worked on with Diptesh and myself. I see. And the problem was in the context of a, of a primary healthcare center. Uh -huh. So the way the problem was defined was your, so let's say the doctors become available over a period of time, right? And so, so we are calling them as servers and, and there is some uncertainty about how many doctors will become available in each period. Okay. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve a maxim, um, multi-period problem and it's a multi-period maximal covering problem. So over, over the horizon, you would like to cover as much of population as possible. Right. Uh, but then what happens is this uh, max. So the the and then what you what so probably you are and there because there is uncertainty. Uh, whatever solution that you find probably may not be the best over all scenarios, mm -hmm. right? So then what you are also trying to find out your optimal solution may be worse from the specific optimal solution for a particular scenario, and then you are trying to find out the regret. So the objective there was to actually uh, m minimize the maximum regret over the entire horizon. I see. And that's how we defined, I mean, you can think of this a uh, measure of fairness or so, uh, because you, you want to be probably as fair as possible to each of these regions. I mean, probably we can modify the objective function to, to so that it actually falls within the definition of your fairness. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. probably, uh, I mean, the way we the way we defined the objective function probably we were not looking at as a as a fairness problem it was a robust problem minimize the maximum regret probably if you redefine the objective function probably because that may probably maybe i mean it is it is us we who define the objective function but probably from a fairness point of view a different objective function may be more suitable and probably I see see probably the problem getting into your definition of the problem and probably something similar can be done. But we can off discuss that offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to see that paper. Uh, some sure, I'll, I'll share yes. I'll share a copy of that paper. Thank with you. you. Thank you. The, the other thing, Sridham, I don't think you mentioned already, maybe you have done, is in terms of computational time, mm -hmm. how does it uh, change as you increase the number of centers and all? So, so uh, it, it's pretty much doesn't change at all with increasing the number of uh, centers going from, we tried 100 to 500, which we formally report, but even when we went over to 1000 or so, uh -huh. the number of centers did not seem to make too much of a difference because, you know, even with large number of centers, typically we use only a handful of columns. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't uh, super decisive. The decisive thing is, how uh, imposing is this transition constraint at the end of the day? And, okay. and it gets harder if you increase the number of uh, your, your decision horizon instead of deciding. So our decisions were for a 30 day time period, but instead if you decide for a 100 day time period, that was getting harder, but increasing the number of locations or anything, uh, nothing happened at all. Yeah, but also other things that demand is almost uncertain. No? So how do you uh, so, so, do the so, worst case or no? So we did not uh, uh, care the care for the demand at all. What we did is, if a certain region has uh, a certain population, we just said this region needs four ambulances to be present there to be completely satisfied. If it is slightly lesser, three, even lesser two, even lesser one. So yeah. we design each location to need certain number of ambulance so that they are happy. Uh, that's all. So, so maybe there are a couple of uh, visitors, Dr. Shaikh, Rakesh, do you all want to have any questions? Pranad, if you have any questions.
Anybody else uh, who are in the audience, attendees, anybody have any last minute pressing questions for Sriram? Without that, you are feeling really terrible. Okay, looks like you did a terrific job, Sriram. I think <laughs> I'm very happy with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so we will uh, we'll catch up with you offline sometime again. Uh, and those who joined us, thank you again for joining this CMHS seminar. I hope you'll be able to attend in the future as well. Uh, thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shriya.